morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone tuning in around the world for this special edition of MAVEN, the platform of American Jewish University for worldwide education and communication. We have over 600 people registered for this session with Nina Siegel on the publication day of her important new book, The Diary Keepers, World War II in the Netherlands, as written by the people who lived through it. Nina's a New York Times journalist who lives in Amsterdam. She's the author of three novels. She's a former Fulbright scholar and the recipient of a 2021 Whiting Creative Nonfiction Grant. She's currently working on her doctoral dissertation at the University of Amsterdam's Research School for Heritage, Memory, and Culture. And thanks to the miracle of modern communication, she's speaking to us today from Amsterdam. I'm here in Los Angeles, and our viewers are from at least three continents around the world. So welcome, Nina Siegel, to Maven, and congratulations on producing a magnificent book. Thank you, Rick. It's such a pleasure to be here, and it's so nice to have a big audience on the on the release date of the book. I haven't really had a chance to talk about it that much yet, so I'm really excited to be in conversation with you, and you're going to be a perfect interlocutor. <laughs> well, as are we. This is a book that I think works on three different but related levels. It's personal, it's literary, and of course, it's historical. It's personal in the sense that in part, it's the personal story of you and your family and your connection. And it's an extraordinary literary accomplishment because it's very skillfully structured. And we'll we'll talk about that in a bit. And it's an important eye-opening historical contribution because it's much different, I think, than the perspective that most of us bring to, um, to Holland based primarily on our exposure probably to Anne Frank's uh, memoir. Um, we don't realize that 75% of the Jews in Holland were not protected and perished in, in the Holocaust. So you read through a collection of more than 2,000 Dutch diaries written during World War II, of ordinary citizens, both Jewish, non-Jewish, resistors and policemen, victims and bystanders, and you translated them into English for us to produce this book. So let's start, if we if we could, with the personal aspects of the book. Tell us about your personal connection, that of your family, to the story, and how you came to write this book. Yeah, so um, my mother was a Holocaust survivor. She was in hiding as a child during the war. And my grandfather was a survivor of Mauthausen. Um, my grandmother um, was also in hiding with my mother. So that whole um, small part of the family survived um, in Europe and then um, left Europe after the war and, and, and went to America. So I grew up with um, stories about the war um, that were very hard for me to understand, little anecdotes that my mother would talk about or things my grandfather would say that I found um, perplexing, confusing. It was a little bit unclear to me what exactly had happened to them and what had happened to this big part of our family that people didn't really talk about anymore. Or they would say, so-and-so perished in the war and as a young person, I just thought it was some kind of cataclysmic, um, you know, windstorm or something. I didn't know what it meant to perish in the war. <laughs> you know, were they all soldiers or what? But um, so, of course, as I grew up, I learned a lot more about the Holocaust and um, and but, you know, growing up in New York as a Jewish person, um, you don't encounter that much about the actual war. It's when you come to Europe, which I did in 2006 and really get the sense of the loss of a community. And I was living when I first moved here in Amsterdam um, in the center of the Jewish quarter or right around the corner from the Jewish quarter. And I realized uh, quite quickly that there were many, many monuments to a Jewish life that had been here um, prior to the war and that had essentially disappeared. And I, um, and I, like many people had the impression that the 
the Dutch had been very protective of the Jews, that there was a lot of resistance, that um, that Holland was one of the you know good countries, <laughs> and uh, so I was very um, rather shocked to find that the the numbers didn't bear that out. That seventy five percent of the Dutch Jewish population died in the camps. More than that, died in other circumstances, some um, by suicide, of course, and others by the hands of um, uh, Dutch people. And so um, uh, it was it was a sort of, sh not shocking, but it was a hard realization. And I wanted to understand if I was gonna live here, what it would mean for me to, in, as a Jewish person to relate to that history. So when you, when you found that you had access to these, these diaries, and well, well, tell us a little bit about how these diaries were collected and how you how you first got access to them. So, um, as you mentioned, I'm a journalist. I cover um, culture and history for The New York Times from from Europe. And um, so I had been doing a number of different stories that had to do with World War II and restitution and various other things. And one day I was at the Neod Institute for War, Holocaust, and Genocide Studies, which is a, an amazing institute in the center of Amsterdam. And I was interviewing a couple of the researchers there, Renee Koch and Eric Summers. And um, after the interview that we did, Renee said, um, I just want to show you one more thing. <laughs> and he, so he uh, he took me down um, through, down through the stairs, down into the archive, which actually has this massive bank vault door and into this room that looked like a scientific laboratory. And inside he cranked open a whole a wall of archives. And, and he said, this whole wall contains diaries that were written in the war period. And they were collected by the NEOD immediately after the war. In fact, the Institute opened three days after liberation. And, um, and the Institute went around collecting them, not just from um, uh, survivors, but also from NS Bayers, which are the Dutch Nazis, and also from resistors, and also from people who had no political affiliation, young people, old people, farmers, you know, housewives. And um, almost like to prove his point, he just pulled one randomly out of the wall, and we opened it up, and there was like a, um, an illustration of Hitler on the cover. And we were both like, oh, okay. And uh, so, but what was really, what caught my eye at first was the visual quality of them because some of them, I mean, people had taken great care to collect, to keep these diaries. Some of them had like index tabs in them for like days and weeks and months. And some of them had like um, illustrations that were made in watercolors. And some of them, um, you know, you could tell that the person only had like a tiny bit, little bit of paper. And so they would scribble into like tiny little print on every single inch of the page. Mm -hmm. And they were just as a material things, kind of amazing to look at. There were actually, there was one that was from Indonesia because um, Dutch people were um, in, in prison in Indonesia. Um, by the Japanese during the war. And there were camps, um, there were prisoners in camps there who kept diaries on the back of cigarette rolling paper and also on Monopoly money. That was what a really interesting one. So um, I was fascinated by them immediately. And I was really interested in the idea that they had collected them in a, in, in a very organized way. Um, so uh, at first I just thought I would write um, an article about them for the Times. And then that article grew and grew and grew and eventually it became essentially this book. So how, how did you, you know, face with this wall of diaries and 2000 in number, some of them multi-volume, some of them, one of them 900 pages long, I know. Um, how did you even begin to select um, the ones that you did and an excerpt from them and what, what, criteria did you use to make that selection? Well, what was really amazing about this collection was that it was not only a collection of things that people had handed in, but it was a curated collection, meaning there were people who worked at the Institute in the 40s and 50s who um, looked at every single submission that came into the Institute and 
um, wrote a report about it and a summary and a criticism. And sometimes the criticisms were really interesting and surprising. Like, you know, this is this is really a stupid person or like this person has, um, all they do is report on what they've heard as rumors or this person that has an exquisite writer with a limited point of view or something like that. So they had these little critiques on the bottom. And um, so there were about a thousand critiques that I could use as a kind of guide to figure out which diaries were interesting, which weren't. And of course, some of the critiques were um, less useful than others. But in addition to that, I had the help of um, Renee Koch, who's the archivist and researcher who, had, who knew the collection pretty well. And also um, in the 1950s, the NEOD published a book that was, um, which I have right here, which is, which is called Dachbuch Fragmenten. And that was a, a collection of the best excerpts from, um, from the diary, from the whole diary trove. So I could use that as like to figure out which dates and stuff were most interesting and which had been written um, in an interesting way. But um, my um, goal with the project was to try and use the collection in the way that it was kind of intended, which was to give a broad overview of uh, the society and how different people had responded to the same or different set of circumstances under the occupation of the Nazis. Well, I think what, you, what you've done is very skillfully used what you found because I certainly expected when I first looked at the book for it to be a compilation of, of, of diaries, perhaps extended entries by one diarist after another. Yeah. And instead, instead, what you've done is 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 quite inventive. I think you've gone chronologically and you bring in excerpts from a particular diarist at a particular time. And then that person comes back at another in another month or another year, and there's another excerpt. And so as it goes along, we we learn about these people. And at first, they're strangers with strange sounding names. And at least by halfway through the book, you one one is familiar with who they are, and 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 one looks forward to hearing what they have to say about what's happening at that point in time so it's a very it's very effective and it's it's got your own essays at the beginning that sort of set the stage and 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 those essays do so in a very fair manner i'm just wondering did, was that originally your structure did did you did you always intend that did did you experiment with certain other ways of doing it I always wanted it to be kind of like a multi-character novel in the, in the structure, in the sense that each of the characters has a voice and they keep coming back and then you get to know them over time. And I, for that reason, I also wanted to choose diaries that were, uh, that were, that spanned the war. So I didn't want diaries that were only 1944. I didn't want diaries that only were at the beginning. Of course, it's, you can't, I couldn't find seven diaries that span the entire war and were totally continuous because some diaries people are you know lose enthusiasm for their diary and they leave it and then they come back to it a year later or it's like um with one of the diarists Dawa Bakker he's a police officer he suddenly stopped writing in October 1943 and we don't know why um Philip Mechanicus um diary of a man who was in a uh, transit camp in in Drenthe he, um, his diary begins um, several months into his imprisonment and then um, ends um, when he leaves the camp. So they're not all continuous, but they, but I was able, what I did was I took the, di the excerpts that I found most relevant and then I basically just put them in chronological order. And I just wanted to see like, how did it work? You know, did it tell a story and could you stick to the stories when you were reading them yeah. and um at first I wasn't sure but the truth was that I didn't I didn't um have to do much to put them in order they there were these convergences that happened on the page that were really remarkable to me that sometimes you would have for example one person witnessing um the the general strike of the population in Amsterdam in 1941 and then um, she's like a factory worker, and then 
um, the, the police officer who's an NS Bayer turns the same corner and like on the next entry, you know, on the same day, and they kind of like, they might have even bumped into each other, but the weird, that, that can be, that, that I found really remarkable. And then there were other moments where you had this contrast, this dramatic contrast between Philip Mechanicus, who's sitting in a concentration camp and talking about how everybody has been required to pluck flies out of the air and deliver 50 flies a day to the commander. <laughs> And then like a minute later, you have the story of this socialite NS Bayer who's sitting at home in, in a requisitioned house in Amsterdam and she's concerned that her cleaning lady isn't coming today. So like the, these contrasts came and um, I felt they were revelatory to me too. I didn't invent them. So, but it, you're right, it does work over time. You find out who these people are and where you don't know their stories, I fill that in. So let's 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 talk about one or two of them, give our, our listeners a better sense of, of who these people were. Yeah. Um, why don't we start with Philip Mechanicus, who he kind of shows up near the middle of the of the book. Mm -hmm. and um, becomes, a, a, at least for me, a, a very compelling personality, both, both tragic and, and, and courageous, uh, very admirable figure. Why don't you, why don't you tell, who, who was Philip Mechanicus, and, and how, how did his diaries get written? So Philip Mechanicus was a um, journalist who, by 1940, was already a very well-established uh, foreign correspondent, and he worked um, as the foreign editor for the Algemeen Handelsblad, which is a very respected national newspaper in the Netherlands. And now it's the NRC, but then it was uh, um, similarly a respected paper. Um, he wrote about Russia, he wrote about um, Palestine in the, in, in the years before it was Israel, and he wrote um, um, from Indonesia. And so he was a very seasoned journalist. And he was arrested in Amsterdam for refusal to wear the Jewish star. He was um, uh, badly abused in uh, Amersfoort camp. We don't know exactly what happened to him, but his hands were crushed and he was unable to. And when he arrived at Westerbork camp, which is a transit camp, in the uh, northeast of the Netherlands, he um, he was in the infirmary. Well, they had a huge, actually, they had a huge hospital ward in Westerbork, and he managed to stay um, in the camp for an extraordinary seventeen months without being deported onward, which was surprising because most other people came through the camp and left within a couple of days. But during the time that he was there, he um, I think he left us with the most profound and important document of that camp experience that exists. It's, a, it's an extraordinary description written by a, uh, an extraordinary writer. He was just such, uh, he was so good at capturing um, social dynamics, different dynamics between the, the Dutch Jews and the German Jews, for example, or the religious Jews and the secular Jews. Uh, he was. He talked a lot about um, different personalities. He just was such an acute observer. And his diary is not, you know, we tend to think of diaries as internal reflections. But his diary is not that. His diary was really a reportage from the front lines of, you know, the Holocaust. It, and it's exquisite. I think, I think it's a real find. And there aren't that many people who know it. Um, certainly, you know, Holocaust historians in the Netherlands know him, but he's very, um, he, he's certainly been overlooked as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, he, cert <laughs> he, he certainly, his, his writing is, is quite remarkable. Uh, it, it, it's, well, let me, let me just, if I could just read yes, one, one, one paragraph from, yeah. his, this, this is on page 227 of, uh, of your book. Um, where he begins by saying, I have the feeling that I am an unofficial reporter covering a shipwreck. The Jews here in Westerbork are like Job on the dung heap. All they possess are a single set of clothes, a suit, 
and some undergarments to cover their meager limbs during the day, and at night a blanket, one pair of shoes, a cap, a knife, a spoon and fork, and a cup. The pious Jews still maintain their faith in God, just like Job did, and testify every Friday night and Saturday to their devotion to the Almighty. The non-pious, who are strong, have faith in their own mental fortitude and bow their heads to the religious traditions of their campmates. He describes in remarkable terms both, both, uh, both sides of uh, the types of people that he met. And I think it's to your great credit that you have so skillfully translated this for us, because I don't think it's a name that's certainly widely known in the West. Um, most of our knowledge focuses on Germany and Austria and Poland and Russia mm -hmm. to a certain extent. And here is somebody who wasn't in a concentration camp. Technically, he was in what I guess is a transport camp, but reading his his diary, it feels more like a concentration camp itself than, yeah. than the, 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 or at least equally one, uh, certainly not merely a place of transport. So it's yeah, quite I a remarkable that, document. Yeah. What's interesting is I think also a lot of people think of Western work in terms of being a transit camp because there were so many, um, you know, sort of facilities there they, they had a school they had a, um, a scientific lab they had a cabaret they had a, a lot of things there were at you know at any given time there might be 20,000 people living in this camp and um, I think what the Nazis did was to make it seem like a kind of um, you know way station or something that it that it was you know semi-habitable but when you read the diary um and other diaries there are other diaries that were written there you understand that this was this was not um a comfortable place to be because people were in constant terror and every day every monday there would be a list that would come of everybody who was going to be transported and everybody knew that the people who were going to be transported would never be heard from again and so it was basically a kind of purgatory and if you think about that kind of psychological hell that people had to go through continuously even if the conditions were not you know what we tend to imagine as you know in Auschwitz or other camps then um it, it's also horrifying and he describes it so vividly and powerfully I think it's uh it's an incredible document and, and with the way you've structured the book as I said before he comes in with paragraphs like the one I read Kind of at the beginning, which is repertorial and and objective, and as he comes in in later months and and years, you can see the effect on him yeah. of being there, suffering himself, but watching the suffering. The fact that he was there for seventeen months yeah. and wasn't transported didn't exempt him from seeing and experiencing what was happening. And you see it; it it comes in periodically, and so it's much. It's very powerful. Uh, and yeah. um, again, let, let's, let's go to the sort of the other side of the equation and, and the Dutch policeman, Dawa Bakker, who, who I may not be pronouncing that correctly. Who, no, you did that well. That was good. <laughs> uh, who wrote a significant diary as well. So uh, tell us about him and, and, and that diary. So, yeah, Dawa Bakker's diary is really fascinating. Um, also, Rene Koch turned me on to that one because he said it's really an extraordinary document. It's 3,300 pages. Um, it's a, uh, he started it in 1938 and then, but he really got going in 1939 and then immediately after the invasion in 1940. He was an um, NSB member, which means he was part of the Dutch National Socialist Party. Um, he had obvious Nazi sympathies. He clipped um, all. He clipped a lot of newspapers and you know uh, images of Nazi propaganda rallies, um, Nazi wins and sea battles. Um, he was very interested in the advance of the of the, the Reich, and um, so his diary. I think of it as a kind of scrapbook of you know the new era that he thought he was part of 
and he refers to himself um, and others in his in his group as um, comrades and in part of, in the revolution. You know, he he thinks of himself in this very clear way as part of the advance of the new cause. Um, so his diary um, was one of the ones that was not transcribed. Um, I should mention that some of the diaries had been transcribed, which was why they were more accessible now than they used to be. Um, but his was one of the ones that was not transcribed. So I had to read that from the original the, the original text. And um, that was very, very challenging because at first I could not read the Dutch scrawl and I had to have somebody in Dutch like transcribe it for me and then I would translate it from the transcription. But then towards the end, I was able to just read his diaries, which was kind of amazing. But he was, um, so he started out as a regular police officer in Amsterdam. Um, regular, but an NS Bayer. Not that many Dutch police officers were NS Bayers, but um, but many of them did end up collaborating with uh, the occupier. But um, he was specifically interested in becoming, you know, part of the Nazi cause. So he um, he rose very quickly in the ranks. Um, and became the head of the Inlichtingendienst, which is the investigations department um, that, that reported directly to the Sicherheitsdienst, which was run by the Germans. So that essentially what happened was um, the Germans wanted to set up a, a, a local police department that people could come to to um, report resistors and Jews and any other problematic figures or any anti-German activity because they figured Dutch people would be afraid to go directly to the Germans but if they had like a Dutch counterpart then they could use that um, as a way to you know round up more problematic anti-German people so that was his department he was the head of that and he not only you know, did his duty to the Germans, but he also was very active in going after uh, the resistance press and um, and um, people who were loitering. Loitering basically meant they had refused to sign up for military duty and things like that. But he wasn't um, he wasn't in charge of the deportations, because that was another department, but he talked frequently about seeing deportations and he would say things like, oh, they took, they rounded up 15,000 Jews in Amsterdam today and that's a good tidying up and things like that. And he had very clear, you know, anti-Semitic ideas. Um, he very often echoed the propaganda that he would clip from the newspaper, which I found really interesting too, because he was, um, you know, he was in a position where he could get insider information, but instead of getting insider information, he actually quotes from propaganda quite frequently. So yeah, he was a very interesting figure to me. And what was what made him especially interesting was that in the post-war period, he was tried for collaboration. And at first he was presented as a kind of, um, um, bumbling buffoon who, you know, failed to help uh, the occupier, help for, failed to help the German Nazis, um, and he only got like seven year sentence. But then um, when it came up to second trial, new evidence was discovered and that evidence was his diary. <laughs> and the diary was used in the court case um, to help convict him as well as more of a fanatic. But then he disavowed that diary and said, oh, I don't, you know, I did write it, but um, that wasn't really me. I wasn't like that. I, it's just a persona that I created for, for, um, for the war. Well, I, <laughs> I found it a, a perversely um, fascinating document because it's not particularly well written, but it is quite, it, it illustrates in a way I really didn't see before in anything I've read what's referred to as the banality of evil. He is kind mm -hmm. of 
doing his job things are he's concerned about his personal position and it, there's no kind of his larger historical sense as you say he's just he, he's repeating the things he's heard um mm -hmm. for his personal advancement as much as any kind of individual belief or thought about what's going on so it's quite every time he comes into the book you get a you get a perspective from his perspective of what's happening to the others at the, at the same time in the book and the contrast is is not only jarring but informative in in itself so it's another another tribute to your to your structure of the book the other thing that i think is so interesting about him is every entry he begins the same way the, the nachrustig and then he gives like a, it says he basically says it was a quiet night or a restful night and then he gives like he reports on the weather so it's like every day, so it's like all this horrible stuff is happening around him. All these things that he's doing are horrendous. And, but he never loses a night of sleep, you know, <laughs> it's a restful night <laughs> and this is the weather. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about, about, about history and, and, and what role diaries play in it, because you do reflect on that near, near, near the end of the book, because yeah. there, there are, we have these diaries. Um, there's also later memoirs. Uh, there's journalism at the time. There's scholarly studies later on. Um, and one tends to think, one, one would think, well, as, as time goes on, our perception of history gets more accurate, more thorough because of the passage of time and perspective. But I found looking at these diaries, and this is the question I want to ask you, the diaries seem to me closer to the truth because they weren't the result of later reflection they were immediate and written at the time and in one sense they're only a first draft of history but in another sense i thought they're they're closer to to history than some of these later later ways of looking at it i just wonder what your thoughts are having having read so many diaries that that you have what, what is yeah. the role of diary what is the role of diaries in our perspective here so i thought it was really interesting when i first started working with them that people told me oh um you know diaries were are really not respected as a source document because they're really unreliable um they report a lot of rumor a lot of times people are just um uh you know re, re reporting you know misinformation and um you know there was this um distrust of um uh witnessing that happened for a really long time in the post-war period the, we we forget about because today we're so immersed in this testimony culture and we and there's so much testimony and we just constantly you know trying to preserve as much testimony as possible but in the po immediate post-war period like 1945 to like 1965 or something even though places like NEOD and other institutions had saved all this firsthand documentation, people didn't use it as information. They used it as like color or like um, peppering, you know, like if you if you want to talk about something that happened in Amsterdam in 1943, you could um, tell what happened, but then you have to like, then you could go to a diary and add a little piece of color. So people didn't regard them as, um, as valuable um, for various different reasons. And then um, I think that, uh, you know, that changed over time. People started to regard them as very important. I mean, Anne Frank's diary, of course, has made, you know, incalculable impact on society and people's ability to relate to the Holocaust. So a lot of diaries individually have been published, but um, still, I think historians are using them more as a kind of little pieces. And, and there are some books that are based really mostly on diary information and mostly on firsthand perspectives, but still they don't like allow the diarist to speak, which is something I really wanted to do was to like do big chunks of you know descriptions from the perspective of different people and let them be real people and throughout the whole book. Um, and I think that, um, you know, we are we're taking a different position, you know, attitude towards this kind of documentation now, especially as, you know, the 
uh, witnesses and the survivors of the war are, you know, passing away and we're losing that generation. Um, and so diaries might be a source that people will go back to more because they were, like you say, they were immediate, they were written down at the time, they have a kind of currency that's that feels very true. <laughs> and I will say that I think we do have to be careful with diaries in the sense that sometimes um, we see them as more truthful because they're, you know, they're so like fresh, hot off the presses and people wrote down exactly what they saw. But I do think there is a certain way in which all diaries are a fictionalization. They're a fictionalization of the persona of the person who's writing them, but they're, they're also, um, you know, they're just a very limited perspective on whatever reality is happening and, and they do include rumor and so on. But um, I think they, they are, um, less guilty than we thought they were in the past. They have they have a quality that makes them very readable and immediate. And the other thing is I thought, you know, they would just be very repetitive. And especially because like as a child of a survivor and who has grown up among people who've told me a lot of Holocaust stories, I, I assumed I was just gonna be kind of reading the same thing over and over again, but it wasn't the case at all. There were, uh, every story was like uh, uh, had twists and turns that I didn't expect that I didn't expect from that person and that like really made it into a, a narrative arc that there was like things that occur that bring us from and you're just kind of watching this adventure unfold for somebody that, in that, the moment as they're as they're living through it they're they're by definition personal partial um written in the heat of the moment as yeah. you say, some of them lie to their diaries, uh, or some of yeah. them, want, you know, feel they'll be they'll be read in the future and are cautious. Some of them are wrong. But it, one of your um, one of the people that you quote in the book, I forget who it is, talked about the difference between living history forward and mm -hmm. living history backward. And I remember Philip Roth in his 1940 uh, counterfactual fictional history of Lindbergh winning the election mm -hmm. instead of FDR said said that we when we read history we're reading the story backwards it's not it's not and it and it and it tends to make us think that well it was inevitable it went from a to b to c to d and that's of course what happened and instead history as you're living through it forward is always contingent you never know what's going to happen tomorrow or next month or much less next year so you get an immediacy that, at least to me, through reading your book, um, with all these caveats about diaries, nevertheless, when you put them together the way you have, um, without saying that one is truth or or you as an author saying here's the facts or the objective perspective, it gives the reader a, an experience of, uh, of living forward through history that's, that's quite remarkable. Oh, thank you. I'm really, that was something I very much strove for because I think I'm very sensitive now. After, um, that was uh, Judith Cohn at the, the, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum who said to me one time when I was looking at some um, photos of, of um, this Dutch Jewish couple who was wearing the yellow star on their, on their um, jackets and they were strolling through Dam Square that's in the center of Amsterdam and they just looked super happy and and it's just I, I looked at it and I just how how could they have been looking so carefree at a moment when they're so clearly marked for death you know and she said but you have to be careful not to think that way because they didn't know at that moment what the future was going to hold and so I think that what I wanted in this in the way of writing this through the diaries was to convey how people lived their lives not knowing what was happening. And um, I do address the question at a certain point about what did they know and when did they know and, and things like that, which is of course crucial. But um, but in the writing of it, I talk, uh, I, I talk a lot about people just trying to make moral decisions on a day-to-day -day basis or try to live their lives or try to convey something or save uh, his, you know, historical truth um, and document it, you know, which is I find also just incredible and the incredible stress that people were living under that they managed to make these 
in, you know, works of literature that, that give us such a clear picture of, of that moment. Let me turn while we still have some time left to some of the questions that, that we've gotten. There have been a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> what, what about the Jewish councils, the, 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 the groups of Jews that were semi-governing institutions or, or organizations is a better word? What, what, what did you find out about them or what perspective do you get from the diaries? So actually, I one of the diaries that I used was written by Miriam uh, Levy Bull. She was Levy in the war. She was Bull after the war. She she was actually um, when the war started, a twenty one year old girl who was working as a secretary for the um, Council for Refugees in the Netherlands, which was helping German Jewish refugees settle in the Netherlands. And then when the um, Nazis took over. Um, all the Jewish organizations in the Netherlands, they basically made them into one, which was the Jewish Council of Amsterdam, and she became a secretary there. So she had a, she kept a, it wasn't a diary, she wrote a series of letters to her fiance who had already gone to Palestine and she was hoping to reunite with him, but because she couldn't reach him and wasn't allowed to send the letters, um, they became a kind of diary of her life. And it is also another extraordinary document that basically looks, tells us from the inside of the Amsterdam Jewish Council what people were dealing with and how they were facing what was an enormous and hor horrible task, which was to try and um, deal with the Nazi overseers. And um, they were forced to um, share a whole bunch of the, the horrendous regulations um, bit by bit. And so many of them, like um, Miriam, who had come from service positions, jobs where they had tried to be helping the Jewish community, were now in an intermediary position that was very uncomfortable. So you see from her perspective what's going on. And you also see inside the Jewish council fights people had, disagreements, arguments, like all this tension that was playing out for them in trying to make decisions about how to deal with their situation. So as you know, the Jewish councils going back to Hannah Arendt have been um, blamed in many ways for, for facilitating uh, the Nazi genocide or for um, collaborating or for being in some way not, not responsible enough for the Jewish community. So I talk about that in the book quite a bit using um, Miriam's diary as a way in. And I talked to her about it. And um, and I think that, uh, you know, there's a lot of new scholarship on this too. Um, someone I know at NEOD, uh, Lauren Vastenhout, just did a, an amazing book that just looked at the pressures that the Jewish, different Jewish councils in Europe were under. And I think that um, essentially there's, you know, this is another form of blaming the victim. You know, there there was, there's just, there's so many other factors in the Netherlands that contributed to, um, you know, the, the, the murder of 75% of the population. The Jewish council, I don't think, is the responsible party. <laughs> and one person wants to know about the, the royal family or the queen or what, what or, or politicians um, in, <laughs> at the time. Did they, yeah. did they, what, what was their attitudes? Did they publish anything? So the Dutch royal family, um, as some people know, they fled um, during the invasion and went to England where they stayed throughout the whole war and they were a government in exile and the cabinet was there too. And they, and the queen would have a, a an address on the radio periodically through Radio Orania, and she made speeches talking to people in her nation about what you know, how to um, go on, and 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 uh, well, someone did a good analysis of the number of times that she mentioned the the Jewish um, persecution, and I, I think I have to look it up, but I think it was four or five times that she mentioned it, but didn't talk about resistance, didn't talk about. Um, you know, specifically about um, things she must have known about at that time. I mean, there has been quite a bit of criticism of the Dutch royal family for not making a persistent, uh, you know, 
<laughs> regular and persistent commentary about the fate of the Jews, as did uh, the royal family in Denmark, for example. So, um, and I think that what happened in the Netherlands too was in, there was not a military um, regime in the occupied Netherlands. It was this, this, they basically, the Germans basically took over the civil administration. So most of the civil servants who had been previously been working, um, except for the cabinet and the heads of government um, were now employed by the Germans. And essentially, if some, if anybody like a mayor or a um, um, city registrar or something didn't go along, they would replace them with someone who was more pro-German. So, um, but essentially, you know, there there was a f <laughs> the the civil administration went along. Um, the royals clearly could have done more. We don't know, you know, it's very easy to look back on history and say, well, this is how it should have been. And nobody did very well when it came to the Jews, as we know in Europe. So uh, it's not a problem that's unique to the Netherlands, but, you know, we can look at these things in hindsight and think about if this happened again, how would we respond? And I hope that some of the lessons we can learn from, you know, from, from these stories. All right, let me let me combine a couple of questions here, two or three actually, um, as a final question because we're running out of time. But what's the current status of Holocaust studies, or uh, in 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 Holland? Is there evidence of de Holocaust denial or revisionism? What what uh, 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 do you expect your book to produce in Holland itself in terms of a reaction? So the last like four chapters of my book, I talk about um, cultural memory and um, what the, the war in memory. And I talk about how it has changed over time. There was a period of silence, then there was a period of reckoning. And then um, little by little, the story of the Dutch Holocaust has gotten more traction. And there's, you know, issues of shame and guilt and various different things. You can, there's a lot to say about that. But um, right now we're at an interesting moment, which is just um, that um, in 2021, um, finally, there was a memorial that was created of the Names Monument by Daniel Liebeskind, which is in Amsterdam now, and it has every single name of um, a victim of the concentration camps from the Netherlands that's listed on a brick. Yeah. And I think it's a beautiful monument. Um, and that's been a big change. It's a way of naming every single individual who was murdered. Um, and then um, this coming year, um, probably in October, there'll be finally a National Holocaust Museum in the Netherlands, and that's not too far from the monument. So both of them together will be a, pretty much a sea change in recognition for um, for the Dutch Jewish story in World War II, but it took a long time to get here. And, uh, you know, there's a quite a long um, narrative of, of struggle <laughs> to make that, that narrative more dominant. And there are people today who say, you know, why are we still talking about this? Who, um, you know, isn't this old history? Why do the Jews keep bringing this up and things like that? And so, um, there, for example, there are politicians, Terry Baudet, who's a, a nationalist uh, right wing politician, who's a Holocaust denier, um, just the same week, I think that the, that the names monument went up, he was, um, he was doing a protest with the, the Jewish uh, star complaining about COVID regulations and saying that um, the, the, the left wing and the Jews don't own World War II, we can use it too, and things like that. So it's, it's um, there's, I think that's still a small faction, but he has a fair number of, um, you know, social media followers, and there are dangerous voices here, like everywhere. There's um, more anti-Semitism throughout Europe as there is in the United States. And so, you know, this these questions are very relevant today. As far as the reaction to my book, I have no, no idea. We'll see. We'll yeah. see. Well, it's a book. It's a book of both historical and current significance for sure. And um, I thank you for the book, for your work, for being with us today. I recommend the book wholeheartedly to the people who are listening to this 
um, uh, today and I wish you success with it. It's, it's a remarkable achievement. So thank you all for being with us today. And thank you, Nina, again for this session. And thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about it. And I hope people will go buy it because I, I just want people to read it at this point and have these voices heard. <laughs>